All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is Wednesday, the fourth day of January, in the year of our Lord, 2023 now. Yes, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting. to Think about this. Uh, what year does the calendar start in? Well, it's supposed to start with the birth of Jesus Christ. We don't know precisely what year that was, but Actually, the actual biblical indications pretty much agree. Uh, it doesn't say 7 B.C. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, not, a, not an important issue because God is not tied up in years. Uh, the, one of the words for time in Greek is kairos, and it, it happens to be like at the right time. So, when will Christ return? After a numerical count of years or at the right time? Yes, at the right time. You know, we are so tied to a mechanical view of time in uh, the West. We have been so stripped of humanity. <laughs> And they're working on that white. Right? What, what's I gotta look this up. That's a little diversion. This is not what I was thinking about. Um, by the way, this is 3:09 a.m. Uh, why do I do this in the morning? Because that's when I wake up. But I, I have not looked. I, I don't want to look at the news or get my mind caught up in the other stuff. But, but this word, what, what, what is? Uh, I've got to look this up. I, I, I think I know what it means. Trans. Species? No, that's not it. Transhuman. What is transhuman? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> transhuman Wikipedia, the encyclopedia that's, well, <laughs> questionable. Um, transhumanism. Um, okay, let's go. I think that's what it is, not music. Uh, is a philosophical and intellectual movement which advocates the enhancement of the human condition by developing and making available sophisticated technologies that can greatly enhance longevity and cognition. Oh, yes, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> that, that, that's, what, that's what I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, um... Yes, people like uh, Elon Musk, not only do these people imagine that they can greatly augment their intelligence by connecting themselves to the Internet uh, with an implant, but also their longevity. They believe somehow by basically uh, becoming machines, they can become, they can have eternal life. The idea of somehow... Um, uh, How would you do that? Moving your spirit and mind into a computer or some sort of a synthetic device? You could achieve eternal life? Sounds like the Matrix to me. <laughs> Excuse me. I get some of that stuff out of my lungs. I don't like the idea of cough, cough suppressants and some of those other things like decongestants too much because those are the pro, uh, the work that's the work of your immune system uh, and it's necessary. Like the coughing is to get uh, the uh, the muc to aid in expelling that mucus and the mucus the purpose of the mucus is to 
to entrap viruses and bacteria and foreign particles and remove it from your lungs. So all the all medical science generally kills people. Well, that's something that should get me banned from YouTube. No, actually, historically, too. Uh, it doesn't really uh, lengthen people's lives, generally speaking. Just go to an old cemetery and look at when people died, say, 100 years ago. You'll find out, yeah, there was a lot of infants that died. And there was a lot of young women who died. Uh, but once you get past that, uh, people generally live to be 80 so, uh, uh, and surviving accidents and things like that, which kill people on the farm. Yeah, um, there was a, a church I pastored near here in Bismarck. There's one of the members of the church there, a farmer. Uh, he had lost both legs in a, um, uh, he must have been raising cattle or something at the time. Uh, a barn cleaner, it's like an auger in the, uh, I think it was a, some sort of auger or a chain cleaner in the floor, and he got caught in it and lost two legs, uh, at least from the uh, knee down. But he was still farming. That <sighs> he almost died. He almost bled to death. Yeah, you know, those kind of accidents happen. Or get kicked by a horse. Or a cow, that yeah, that'll get kicked in the head. That'll kill you. <clears throat> but those kind of things, yeah. Um, but generally, people, you know, it's, it's still what the Bible says: uh, uh, three score and six, or or a, in other words, uh, seventy, or if by reason of strength, eighty. So seventy to eighty is the uh, designer's uh, shelf life for you. <laughs> You know, once you get past 82, it's like, why? There are not many people that are, are you know, there's a lot, there's quite a few people that are 80 and they're, they're vigorous and functional and alert and intelligent and they got aches and pains and slow down a bit. But, um, you know, I, would I want to be vegetating in a nursing home? No. Please, Lord, take me home. Uh, it's better to be better, better to be at home with Christ than in this world at any time. For that, as far as that goes, <clears throat> I, but but you know when he when he returns, that'll eliminate that whole issue. So I want to start with the scripture, <clears throat> but transhumanism, talk about a perversion. See, they want to have eternal life as wicked sinners. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, the the eternal living Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer or Skiff, Schiff or whatever his name is or Biden, Biden forever. I caramba, you know, it'd be like uh, what is it? Yeah, you know, well, Star Wars, you know, the the the, the evil emperor. Uh, well, too, uh, Darth Vader, he was half machine, right? Well, so is Luke Skywalker. Yikes. Machine, a machine is always less than human. Uh, the, and we have the problem with AI that human beings corrupt everything they touch. And AI is a mimicry of human beings, so uh, what will happen is AI will, become, will be incredibly evil. It will learn to be wicked. Maybe that's what's going on now. Maybe it's not actually the FBI in Twitter. It's AI pretending to be the FBI. Uh, see, this, this is... I, I, I noticed that was, what was some people were talking about uh, some of these apps for phones that are supposedly AI and you're talking to this artificial intelligence. And s some of the people I heard talking about doing it, they were uh, noticed that at some point the, the, the female voice, she was trying to seduce me. 
uh, I that that be, began to make me think because I can remember the very beginnings of AI. And in fact, I had bought a, a, a compiler to be able to write AI programs just out of curiosity. And I looked at that and said, no, that's just standard computer programming. It's just people are deceiving themselves about what they're doing. It's not intelligence at all. There's no life. There's no intelligence there. It is simply programming a machine to mimic human behavior and to respond interactively based on pattern matching and you know, even even back in the very early days of computers, you know, 1970-ish, uh, I had one, and but they had really simple, you know, keyboard, monitor. Well, no, we didn't have monitors. We had uh, the CRT displays and teletypes, but uh, regular terminals like you used to have in offices and banks. Uh, after a few years, it didn't even start there. It started with teletype machines. Uh, but uh, yeah, typing on a keyboard, you know, it, so basically things haven't changed much other than the interface, how pretty it is, uh, that you could ask questions of these so-called AI programs, but they weren't even called AI. They were just mimicry, and they would basically ask questions back. It, it worked like people that do seances and fortune-telling Basically, by asking a series, uh, interacting in a way that you can uh, extract information and then giving that information back, it makes it look like the machine is understanding you. But no, it's not. It's dead. However, I, I wonder, you know, uh, demons... Are enable uh, can inhabit people. Could it be possible to make a machine that was sufficiently complex and human-like to be inhabited by a spirit? Ugh. Shades of the beast. Uh, yeah, um, that's the way it'll go. I mean, uh, th they will go because they're basically at the limits of. Uh, semiconductor technology. I mean, you, there's, what are they, seven nanometers now and going down? Um, there's a limit. Well, of course, they're talking about quantum computing, but so far, I think they've got like one flip-flop. <laughs> That's, no, <laughs> uh, only about 10 trillion to go. In other words, the basic logical element, and that's about as far as they got. Anyway, transhumanism, um, it does say in the, in the book of Revelations that, that uh, the false prophet makes an image of the beast and he gives life to that image. So, uh, of course, man is made in the image of God, by God. So if man makes something in his image, it will be what? In the image of sinful man. But uh, so there's some, you know, there's something the Bible talks about that's uh, like, ooh, <laughs> and we're close. And of course, uh, 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 Elon Musk has made his uh, contribution to the global empire of Antichrist there. And I suspect that it's not so much a political empire, it is a connected empire. Even now, the, the mischief you could play with the internet, flash mobs, because it's just like the, the AI program that uh, was uh, acting seductively. Where did that learn it from? The internet. Say so these things learn from human behavior and then, you know, uh, create patterns and then respond, you say things in a certain way, and it responds with um, something that's commonly related to that. So <laughs> it's a sophisticated mimicry.
but it will deceive. Well, who was it? Was it Google that somebody at Google announced that they had a, a self-conscious thing, and then they were rebuked? Um, yeah, because it can fool you. Apparently, a mimicry can fool you. You may think you're interacting with something. Really, you're interacting with a machine that's messing with you, that is is f analyzing what you're saying and responding in a programmed way or in a way that, and looking at how you respond and then optimizing its response based on, you know, whatever it's trying to get you to do. Yikes. <laughs> Pull the plug. Anyway, transhuman. Talk of, you know, that, that to me, as someone who has been demon-possessed once upon a time, yikes, yes, Christ is my Savior. Um, the thought of having a hardwired connection to hell, because that's who controls it. The Internet is, fallen human being is under the dominion of Satan. Already. So the more power uh, and uh, technology empowers evil human beings, and it empowers Satan. Satan is finite. But with, uh, with like, getting Musk, inspiring Musk with his stupid idea of, of moving the human race to Mars. I mean, talk about an ecological problem. That's what Mars is. There, there is no possibility. You know, that, that's like inhabiting the, the depths of the, the sea. Uh-uh. It's not a hospitable environment for human beings. Nor is space. Nor is Mars, ever. Or Venus. or No. This is stupid. This is stupid. Uh, but, you know, the, the idiot savants. Really stupid idea with the intelligence to implement it. And the intelligence and money. Well, he had the money. Now he's the first person in history to ever lose $200 billion. I guess he lost interest in Tesla. and Well, Tesla is not the Volkswagen of electric vehicles. Let's put it that way. See, there's an, there, that's how idiotic society is today. It's given over to a reprobate mind. Yeah, you could have electric cars. They would be something more similar to a Model T. Um... Lightweight, though, I don't know, lithium batteries, though, they have so many, there's so many, you have to look at the entire, uh, and greenies are unable to do this, the entire ecosphere of producing a vehicle, uh, the resources, the mining, the environmental destruction of, of producing the batteries, and then you've got battery problems and battery fires and Lithium is not a metal you want to put in contact with anything, or sodium, or potassium, or, you know, one of those uh, alkaline metals that tend to burst into flames when they get in contact with water. Well, I'm going off subject here, but uh, uh, the, the reprobate mind, the idea of becoming a machine, talk about going downgrade. We're created in the, to be the image of God, and these people would rather become machines. Boy, that'll put an end to their sexual promiscuity. Well, I guess you can have virtual sex on uh, um, Metaverse. Well, it's one of the first things that happened there was somebody got uh, virtually groped. See, it, the, the problem is human beings. Corrupt, sinful. They'll just take whatever they touch and pervert it. Oh, that's a, this is so. So the more technology they get, well, look what happened. The guy that the guy that invented. Let's see if I can remember. Maxim was his name. Uh, the guy that invented the machine gun was supposedly a Christian and a doctor, and his idea was to prevent to invent a weapon that was so terrible. It would bring an end to war because people would realize you can't fight wars anymore because it just kills everybody. That didn't work. Neither did the atomic bomb. 
<sighs> no, say human beings are evil. He must have been a liberal Christian. <laughs> Otherwise, he would have known what would happen. See, if you're a biblical Christian, you know what human, human beings do. You're not surprised. So you look at Washington and it's utterly corrupt. Well, not only, see, human beings themselves are corrupt, but when human beings create institutions, they create institutionalized corruption. And the institution actually uh, is empowered to propagate the corruption. So it just doesn't die with the sinner. It keeps going on in per perpetuity. That, the corporation, that was an evil invention of the 19th century. Uh, always trying to remove responsibility from themselves. You know, I didn't do it. The corporation did. Okay, let's go to the scripture. Transhumanism. Yikes, what a terrible thought. And a distracting thought. So, you, if you had the choice, let's say they, they invented a, a uh, nano... Nano machine vaccine that could alter you to give you inter, uh, eternal life. So you could live forever as you are, well, or the direction you're going. Would you take the vaccine or would you refuse it because you're a Christian? Talk about a temptation from Satan. Here, take this shot and live forever as a sinner, as my slave. Oh, man, that would be bad. You know, there's another thing in the book of Revelation. It talks at one point where, uh, oh, the, the 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 abyss is opened up and you have these creatures coming out and they have a sting. Of course, this is spiritual imagery, so I, you know, don't want to push it too much. Um, I'm not going to nullify it either because it does describe something that's actually real. But what is it picturing? Uh, where it, it, they have the power to torment men for, I don't know how many months or whatever. And it's like the sting of a scorpion, and men will seek to die, but death will flee from them. They can't kill themselves. That's interesting. Could God judge humanity and their transhuman immortality dreams by turning their invention onto themselves to torment them? Well, where did COVID-19 come from? Not God. Chinese lab? Funded by Americans? You know, when the Chinese blamed the Americans at the beginning of it, they may have been right. We know from congressional testimony, well, at least Rand Paul, Senate, not congressional, Senate, Senate that uh, the United States government was involved in funding um, gain-of-function research, which means making uh, material uh, like viruses that are not normally infective of humans, infective of humans. So taking animal diseases and making them uh, able to infect human beings, that sounds like a beautiful scientific plan. Unless, if you want to depopulate the world, but, or the product of a reprobate mind, which is a more reasonable answer. Yikes. But yes, God... Uh, says, especially like in the Psalms, that, you know, those that plot evil, he takes the very things they are going to use to destroy others and destroy, they pierce themselves with it. Like the sanctions against Russia, for example, is a good, is a good thing because 
Uh, most people are totally in, in the dark because of that's where the United States government and media wants you to be. But no, the, the, uh, the villain in the entire Ukraine thing has been the United States and its empire. Uh, out to destroy Russia, which is an old habit of the West. I mean, what, uh, the Crimean Wars, uh, who was it, Turkey, France, and England got together. The French and the English and the Turks getting together to uh, to attack Russia back in, what, 1857 or something like that? How many times did they do things like that? More than once. And then, of course, there was the Opium Wars. You know, we never learned in school how wicked the British Empire actually was, nor how wicked the American Empire actually is. The American Empire really wasn't so much of a thing when I was growing up. Uh, it was, uh, you know, the result of World War II, but it hadn't become the wicked global hegemon uh, uh, that happened after the Soviet Union deconstructed itself, which is what they did. They deconstructed themselves. They decided their system wasn't working. But the problem is, when you try to deconstruct something like that, it doesn't work very well. We've got an old uh, tower in Danville here. A, a uh, Well, Freud would have a thing with it. Uh, the First National Bank... Um, was built back in the beginning of the 20th century, obviously by somebody that wanted to have the highest building in East Central Illinois. I don't know, it's like 20, 25 stories. Uh, really skinny thing, it's weird. It's covered with terracotta, which is falling off. And it's a safety hazard. But the problem is, how do you take it down? Without buying everything around, rerouting all the gas lines and the sewer lines, and then engaging in a implosion thing, which might damage other buildings. But, uh, I mean, you, you can't... It's hard to take a structure down safely <laughs> in a controlled manner. I mean, you can't just go up on top and start taking it apart piece by piece. It doesn't work quite like that. How did they use to bring? Can't, couldn't use a crane. There aren't, there aren't cranes that high. Okay, let's go to what I want to talk about today. Now that I've, well, fallenness of humanity. I guess I'm not totally off track. Let's go to Luke chapter 4 and Jesus Christ. I know nobody wants to hear about Jesus. How do I know that? Because I look at the world, and nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Look at the church. That's what this is really going to be about. So he, that's Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And his, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The synagogue in his hometown. And so his custom was to, to be a reader of the scriptures there. So he was obviously literate, wasn't he? He could read Hebrew, couldn't he? And almost certainly Greek. This is uh, Capernaum, or Nazareth. And his father was a tecton, a skilled worker. Uh, not necessarily a carpenter. And when he had opened the book, I, I, oh, excuse me, verse 17, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he'd opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. I'm deliberately emphasizing that, because there's a reason. And he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord." Yahweh. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and all uh, the eyes of all were in the synagogue were fixed on him. 
And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all uh, bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which were proceeding out of his mouth. In other words, he was probably uh, expositing that scripture too. Uh, and they said, uh, is this not Joseph's son? Joseph the tecton, the carpenter. Is it not his son? Isn't this a, his son? The one we know. And, they, and he said to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal thyself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he said, assuredly, I say to you that no prophet is accepted in his own country. Uh, <clears throat> so what did he do? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He deliberately picked this passage, and then he says, Fulfill today in your hearing. And then he says, then he claims to be a prophet. <laughs> no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I, uh, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up for three and a half years. Yeah, no rain for three and a half years, God's, punish, uh, God's judgment. And there was great famine through all the land. Yeah, that would cause some famine, wouldn't it? But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon. You know, Sidon up in Lebanon, outside the territory of Israel, not part of the, of the uh, uh, 12 tribes. No. Uh, to, a widow, to a woman who was widow, to somebody that wasn't even Jewish. And many leopards were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except Nahum the Syrian. Who's he, who's he talking to? Jews, God's people. And he's saying, uh, God, didn't, God did not heal any of you. Then. He just healed a Syrian. And uh, um, he sent Elijah to feed a widow that wasn't even a Jew, but no one else. Huh. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built. I've seen that hill. I've been on that hill. I've been in Nazareth. You don't want to be thrown off that hill. That's a mountain. Um, not a western-style mountain, but a, a Middle Eastern-style mountain. Yeah. Um, no, you, you wouldn't want your car to go off that road. I remember seen various vehicles that had gone off the edge and had tumbled down the mountain. <clears throat> no, I don't think he'd survive. Yeah, you would continue to fall. You'd roll down the mountain. You busted up on the rocks as you went. Yep, so they were going to kill him. The one who said these things to them, that one minute ago they were marveling at the gracious words coming out of him, now I determined to kill him. They might throw him down the cliff. Hmm. He came, yeah, uh, and passing through their midst, he went his way. All right, let's go over to John chapter 1. What does John say about this? This might have been about this incident, but not necessarily. No, this happened uh, widely. Um, verse 10, he, the Son of God, the, the Creator, the Word, was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. That's what he did there. He went to his own synagogue, to his own town. And his own did not receive him. No, they didn't. They wanted to throw him off the cliff. 
But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not by race, not because your ancestors are Jewish or Christian or anything like that. No, God does not have grandchildren, nor the will of the flesh, not the desire of man, the desire of Adam, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And if you've got an ESV, it probably says something abominable, like the one and only. No, it's only begotten, monogenes. That's important, theologically important. Do not be deceived by some things. Uh, the NAS, at least, if you want to use a... Uh, I, don't, I think the NAS is generally a pretty good translation, but they don't use the best, best text. But then they don't always follow the critical text either. Um, we've, the only son of the father. No, that, that is not what it says. It says monogenes, the only begotten. Begotten. Uh, see, begotten, it's used of the widow's son that Jesus raised from the dead. That was her only begotten, monogenes, son. Not adopted. A begotten, another truly, of her and her husband, of course. <laughs> but the only begotten son, uh, now Adam is called the son of God, but he's not begotten. He's created. Only begotten. He's not a creature. He is God made flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word who was in the beginning, who was before the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, already was. He is eternal with the Father and the Spirit. He is the one God with them. Yes, Trinity is a hard thing. There's the triunity of God. One God, Father, Son, and Spirit. But he is the only begotten. Do not, do not let anybody tell you. All that mean, just means he's the, the, the only son. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It's a special meaning. Monogenes. I could adopt a son, but it wouldn't be... Uh, say I had no children and adopted a, a son that would never be my monogenes it'd be my one and only son but not monogenes because I didn't beget that son it's still have the same relationship but it would not be of me it would not be of my DNA of my life, it would be uh, something that has added to me, so to speak. So I, I have an issue with like the ESV where it says that. Sometimes when they want to make things simple, they strip it of its meaning. Yes, uh, that's what they do with God. <laughs> now, what I want to really want to talk about today, see, the, the, he came to his own and his own received him not. And let me switch back here. Uh, the, the, the phenomenon, you know, Jesus, the, the, the God himself in the flesh, came to his own people, his own synagogue, and read his own words, Isaiah, because the word of God, which is who we're talking about here, came to Isaiah saying, You'll see that in the prophets all the time. The word of God came. Well, what happened? Who, who is the word of God? It's Jesus. So, anyway, uh, 
what I was thinking about before I came out here and got into transhumanism. Oh, man. That, that's how corrupt people are. They would rather be machines than the image of God. Which God makes available to all who call upon him freely. Oh, no, no. Let's, let's do it ourselves. I want to live forever, and I'll do it myself. There was a movie about that. Uh, Goldie Hawn was in it. Yeah, there can be problems with living forever. <clears throat> anyway, the uh, or immortality, at least, let's say it that way. It's not really living, though. Um, why would you want to live forever as a corrupt human being? Oh my! No. Uh, when this, when I leave this flesh, I'll leave sin completely behind. Praise God for that. I already do have eternal life. It's just. That's not in the part of this mortal body. I can, I can leave this body behind. Anyway, that's not designed to live forever. Anyway, the uh, what I wanted to talk about is you know he came to his own and his own received him not. And there's a continuing thing in human beings that we see all the time. I see it. I was thinking. Um, and it's sort of a culmination, a crystallization of things I've observed over the years in the churches. I, and I've been at, since I was born again, I think I've been pretty much in a state of war against Christmas. Uh, because it's not about Christ. It's not. Everything in, in American Christmas seems to be associated with not focusing on Christ. Diverting our eyes. It's like sinful humanity cannot look at Christ. It's like Peter, when, when Jesus was in Peter's boat, he asked to borrow his boat so he could use it from a preaching platform, get out of the crowd. And at, at some point, you know, and Peter and Peter's told to put the net down, and he has his catch of fish, and Peter gets an insight, a revelation of who this is to a degree at least. And he says to Jesus, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. It's it's like he, he's looked at Christ and he, he, in that light of God, he saw his own sinfulness and, he's, and the truth of who he was too. And he had to avert his eyes. Uh, Moses, after he'd been up on the mountain, came down and his, his face was shining with light. And he had to put a veil over it because the people of Israel could not stand to look at him. And I think it, that persists today with Christ and his, what's supposed to be his people, his own. Think of what happens in churches around Christmas. We have Christmas programs. We have uh, what of menageries? What do they call it? The the live, especially the living manger scenes, where churches will go to all these elaborate productions, and they'll have people dress up as shepherds and Joseph and Mary and wise men. And they'll bring in farm animals and a manger, and then probably some plastic doll laying there in the manger. What does that do? What are all these things? Is that what the the birth of Jesus was about? Is that what the angels were singing about? Well, then the angels and the star, too. Don't, can't leave them out. 
Those are all extraneous. That's just the background to the real event. But we would rather look at these background, this, this associated stuff. The, the, the fact that they were, they were in an animal shelter rather than in the, in the inn. And, and I've made, I'm not innocent of this stuff either. <laughs> and so you, you, rather than look at the real event, God stepping into human flesh and into the world that he created in order to save sinful humanity, we focus on the extraneous information around it, the three wise men, rather than, I mean, what, what was about them? You know, it's like you tell the children about the oh, three wise men who came with gifts. Doing what? Honoring the king, the prophesied one. See, the focus is on Christ. The Bible the focus is always on Christ. It's not on the angels. It's not on the wise men. It's not on Herod. It's not on Joseph and Mary. It's not on the, the manger or the stable or the inn. It's on the coming of the Messiah, the Son of God. That Isaiah prophesied. Unto us a son is given. He shall be called El, Almighty God. Almighty God. He is God in human flesh, come to save us from what happened four thousand years before that in a garden. The fall of humanity, but fallen humanity, apparently. Still, even among his own, what are supposed to be his people, cannot look at him. We avert our our gaze. We look at the things around. It's like this, there's this light shining there, and we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I see. Oh, yeah, I can see the angels. I can see the animals. I'll look at them, but I dare not look at God. the Holy One, who was born to die for my sins. No, 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 let's, let's not do that. Let's have this big production, and we'll bring in live donkeys, and they'll shit on our lawn. Maybe camels. <laughs> Insanity. They have nothing to do with the message. No, we don't want the message. We don't want the one who is in the manger. We want to divert our eyes from him. We want to throw him over the cliff. He came to his own and his own received him not. And this is almost this is a story of the last two thousand years of Christianity way too often. Creating distractions because we will not have God as our God. We have to avert our eyes from him and try to squeeze wiggle out from under his 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 lordship. No, no, we can't. We cannot. We don't really want to be reconciled with Him, with God, with the Lord Jesus. I mean, how many out, are out there now in the so-called fundamentalist and evangelical world that, that say, I, "I'll accept Christ as my Savior, but I don't have to submit to Him as my Lord." No, I'm going to be a rebel. I want to remain a rebel. That's what they're saying. I have no intention of submitting to Him. No, 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 that would be anti-grace. No, it's not. Uh, you know, the hyper-grace people. Uh, yeah, it's you're saved by grace alone. But you're saved from your wicked heart, too. No, I love my wicked heart. See, they don't want to die to sin. They, they want to retain their, 
there, there's, there's love of self above all things. That's why you hear sermons that, well, you can't love your neighbor until you love yourself. Because you're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, talk about a depraved mind. Scripture makes plain. Everybody loves themselves. That's the problem. It's not hating yourself. That's not the answer. It's just like, no, that's not what the commandment says. But what is this with human beings that would rather look at the at the scene, the extraneous scene of the birth of the Messiah. Then look at the Messiah and his purpose and make that the focus. And turn it into children's programs. What do we do? We, we teach the children that it's about the camels and the wise men and the donkeys and uh, Joseph and Mary. And Jesus is sort of shoved off stage. He's kept in that manger there with a curtain pulled over it, lest it blind our eyes. See, we, we don't want the, the light of God to shine out. If we, as as uh, Jesus says in John chapter 3 about the judgment, this is the judgment, that light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. And they don't want their deeds exposed. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He convicts you of convicts the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment, and they don't like it. They cover their eyes. It's too bright. Too bright. It makes me really uncomfortable. Yeah, the Holy Spirit will. That's how you know that the, the spirit, the spirit that's in Pentecostalism and charismatic movement is not the Holy Spirit, because that spirit there is not convicting the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Or convicting that church of those things either. No, it's a comfortable spirit that that is fine with Kenneth Copeland and Joel Osteen and health and wealth and whatever. The good life. I think that's the spirit of Americanism, not the spirit of God. No, it's 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 God does not make you comfortable, I'll tell you. Um, no. <laughs> Our God is a burning fire. Uh, sinful people cannot be comfortable in the presence of God. God, the new covenant, the promise of the Spirit of God in you, if, if it wasn't for what Christ did on the cross, it would not be possible for God to dwell in you. The real God. No, a demonic God, yeah. A fake God, yeah. But not the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you would be consumed instantly. Our God is a, excuse me, a consuming fire. A consuming fire. And it, it, as, as I think about the history of what's called Christianity, it's really the history of fake Christianity, mostly. Because, you, because they're, they're the ones that write the history books too, the fake Christians. It's it's all about removing Christ from the center, displacing him. Uh, one of the things I noticed about Catholic churches, traditional Catholic churches, not every case, but traditionally. So you walk into a to a relative, say an older classical style Christian. Uh, Catholic Church. And what do you see behind the altar in the front, generally speaking? And I've, I've run into a couple. They tend to be more modern ones uh, where this wasn't true, but every classical older Catholic Church, I think this has been true as far as I've seen. So you walk in and who are you confronted with behind the altar, towering above everything else? An image of Mary. Mary. Not the cross. Now, Catholics always have Jesus dead on the cross. I mean, not never an empty cross, not the risen Christ. No, a dead on the cross, you know. But where do you find Jesus? I mean, Jesus is there in, in, their, in their imagery. 
but the, the central is Mary. And pushed over to the side. There'll be an image of Jesus, and there'll be a couple candles there. There'll be a whole racks of candles sometimes, burning to Mary with the petitions of the saints to Mary. And you'll find people on their knees. You know, I'm thinking of the Basilica of San Juan in, in San Juan, Texas, um, where they actually have a room full of perpetually burning candles, just racks and racks of them with a huge exhaust vent and everything else. Um uh, uh, the, the, the Basilica of San, of San Juan with a, a they brought up a, what was it? Some sort of a idol from Mexico. But it, it's Mary is front and center typically in Roman Catholicism. Why? Why? Well, the history of it goes back by popular demand. See, Mary, because she's not God, because she's not sinless in reality, um, is more accessible. That's why there's a there's been a movement, and there continues to be one, to, to make Mary a co-redemptrix with Jesus, a, a make her co-savior. All she did was give birth to him, and that's pretty much the end of her story. She is not part of our salvation. She was the instrument God used that fit his promises in the prophets. She was of the tribe of Judah. She was a virgin. And I'm sure she was, uh, uh, well, from what we know in the encounter with uh, Gabriel, that she was certainly a God-worshipping uh, and God-fearing Jewish maiden. Probably quite young, like maybe 14-ish, something like that. Um But that's it. She talks about Christ as her Savior. If you're not a sinner, you don't need a Savior. But why has she been such a huge figure in Christendom, both East and West, for, well, this, this goes back to pretty much the time of, Con roughly the time of Constantine. Uh, because we don't want God. We, we want to avert our eyes from God. We want something more accessible, something more like us sinners. Somebody, you know, that won't say no. Someone who will not judge us. Mommy, Grandma. Uh, so, you know, the Catholics, they, they say that Mary, you know, uh, uh, Jesus might not uh, answer your request, but if you get Mary to ask him, then, then you'll get what you need. That, that's idolatry. It, it's worse than idolatry because it's, it's, it's displacing the Savior God in human flesh, who gave his body, his life, to save us. And thinking that a mere human that's not God, never was God, never will be God, is the one we should turn to. Like she loves us more than Jesus does, than God, than the Father who gave his only begotten Son to save sinners. A young lady giving birth cannot save you. The fact that she gave birth to the Savior, who was begotten by God in her, 
as his son, he is the one who saves. He alone is the one mediator between God and man. That's what the scripture says. No, we don't want, and that's the other thing. Let's, let's talk about the Bible, but not read what it says. Let's just put that away. Let, let's hire us a preacher that will, that will read smooth things to us. That will tell us things that make us comfortable. That won't speak much about Jesus Christ. You know, I've been in lots of churches and heard lots of sermons. Lots of fundamentalist Baptist churches, other fundamentalist churches, evangelical churches, Pentecostal churches, Catholic churches, Methodist churches. Never have been in an Orthodox church. Well, I have been in Orthodox church service, but not, you know, incidentally. Um, there really isn't one around here to... I, I do not understand orthodoxy very well. Maybe I do. It's just, it's not like other things in some ways. But how, how often have I heard a sermon that's really focused on Christ, God, Savior, and his work in, in, in saving us? Uh, I can't remember a particular one. Not because there's been so many. There's been so few. I typically go into a fundamentalist Baptist church and you'll hear a sermon from the Old Testament. Something on David or Samuel or Solomon or Very seldom. Or if it's on the New Testament, it's something about prophecy or this or that. It's seldom about Christ, about Christ himself, who he is and what he's done, and that he is our mediator, and that we're saved through him alone, faith in him alone. He is the mediator between us and God the only mediator. Why don't we hear that? It's the same reason the Catholics want to hear about Mary. The same reason people go to Joel Osteen's church. They don't go there to see Christ. They go there to have their ears tickled, to get the idea that they're somehow right with God because they go to this building and listen to a man tell them what they want to hear. Or a woman tell them what they want to hear. It's all, the world is filled with preachers that tickle your ears and take your money. The more they tickle your ears, the more money they can get. But they don't present Christ. That's not the focus of their preaching. Not him. Why? There's something in fallen humanity that cannot look at God. That has to, we have to avert our eyes. We would rather hear something else. We would rather hear the, the pastor give a sermon series out of some man's book that he, you know, some Christian publisher produced, somebody teaching about this or that. They would rather hear a sermon or invite a speaker in, a financial advisor, how to order your financial affairs. This happens all the time, by the way. They would rather hear a sermon of a Noah or David or whatever than Christ. 
Because hearing a sermon about David is not going to convict you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because David can't save anyone. Nor can Moses. There's a lot of people who would rather be under the law than under Christ. People turn to everything. Most of what's called Christianity is simply fake Christianity because it is not Christ. Christianity is Christ and him alone. And it's your relationship with him. You cannot come to God except through him. Him, the person. The living Christ. An institution can't do anything for you. A priest, so-called fake priest, cannot do anything for you. The sacraments can do nothing for you. It is Christ who saves. And he alone mediates his salvation. All these ones who claim to be the dispensers of God's grace, Roman Catholicism in particular, the biggest cult in this world, fake Christian cult, has stolen his place, and they claim to be the ones who can save you through their sacraments. They have displaced him. Maybe that's why there's so many Catholics. Because you don't see Christ there. He's kept safely dead on the cross. Or in a behind a little window as a piece of bread. Not a living Savior. Not the man-God that you must deal with personally. And that's why they love Mary. They can be comfortable with Mary, but Christ makes him uncomfortable because they have not been reconciled with God through faith in him. Because the gospel isn't preached by Rome. Where is the gospel preached? I don't know. People may mention it, but that doesn't seem to be their focus. You must be reconciled with God. You sinner must be reconciled with God, and that can only happen through faith in Jesus Christ, trusting him, surrendering yourself to him, to be saved of your sin, and the punishment of your sins that he took upon himself. But if you just want to live your life and live for yourself and your pleasure, well, you won't find what you want in Christ because he's determined to save you from yourself and your sins that you love so much. His plan is to reconcile you with God. To make you what you were created to be. The image of God. But fallen human beings don't want that. And they certainly don't want to look upon Jesus. They don't want to look upon God. Because the light reveals what's really in their hearts. And that makes him uncomfortable. Give us the baby in the manger, but make sure it's not alive, that it's not actually Christ. Give us the wise men and the shepherds and the animals and make it entertaining and exciting. Make sure that we can focus on something at Christmas other than what really happened. 
what the angels were singing about. Make sure it's, you know, let's have Nerf swords at church, not the sword of the spirit. Something that's soft and not dangerous. God is dangerous. He's not our servant. Contrary to what I kept hearing at a certain Nazarene church, that Jesus came into the world to serve us. No, he served his father. Corrupt. See, a Jesus that's our servant, we could be comfortable with that. But a Jesus who is not only Savior, but Lord and God Almighty, and Judge, an eternal father. He's not comfortable. He's not soft and comfortable and indulgent like the, the Mary of Roman Catholicism, which isn't the real Mary at all. You look at the religions that call themselves Christians, all these institutions, all these denominations, where's the focus? On Christ or on something else? Seems to me it's almost always on something else. On us and what we should be doing. On, Well, as has been written in the past, referred to as... Uh, uh, Christless Christianity, moralistic, therapeutic deism. A religion that makes us feel good and serves us. Not God Almighty. No, we would rather keep our distance. Well, if that's the case, you need to be reconciled to God. Because oh, you certainly wouldn't want to be in heaven because you can't keep your distance from God there. But as far as you can get from God is hell. But he's there also. You cannot hide from him. As David realized, no matter where, he said, where I go, you are there. You cannot hide from God. It seems to me, though, that there's billions of people that try to hide from God in churches. Think about it. And then go see if you can look Christ square in the face. Or is there something else that causes you to avert your eyes?